Before I decided to be a musician, I thought I was going to be a scientist, and that's what I love. And that's one of the main reasons why this is so, so significant to me, just to be working with the students and to be at MIT. Miguel Zanon is an alto saxophonist, composer, hailing from Puerto Rico, a Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellow, and one of the most important uh, jazz musicians of our time. He has really set the music world on fire with his fantastic ability to fuse melody, harmony, and rhythm in a very special and innovative way. this great composer, great artist, and he wants to try out this idea where he talks to a few students about their research and he tries to incorporate that into the music that he composes. They can play it exactly as it is, that's cool, but also it could be loose. Just kind of play it off that. Okay. Know? One of those sections is gonna have to repeat. We're gonna make it like a repeat so that ah. we're gonna have a little more time. Okay, before this. Before that. Okay. I met with Miguel at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> um, and we spoke about the public service projects I had been doing most recently. The thing that really sort of blew me away was this, like, just the devotion that she had. That's sort of like her calling, you know, like really just looking for ways to be of service. The main title is Music as Service, and it comes from a quote from Kyla. You know, it's like music is part of what they have to offer. I really love that title because I think it just is so true. Music as like a service to the community, as a service to individuals. And music has served me like enormously. first movement is properties, and it's the movement that came out of the conversation with Anna. Anna was working with properties of carbon nanotubes. When we're reinforcing a material, we add in new materials into a material that already exists in different orientations. Um, so that can change the conductivity of a material, as well as the toughness. Seeing what we can do with materials in general, what kind of weird properties we can find and use. To me, what that told me was like, you have like a smaller, fast moving layer within a larger layer, you know? So musically, I was trying to portray that on the piece and actually went into the uh, molecular structure of carbon to translate into numbers and music uh, to write a lot of the piece. The rhythm is so crazy. I was like, what is going on? Like, what did he see and, and what did I tell him? <laughs> it kind of came as a surprise to me and I think it's not until today that I realized oh wow like I'm saying properties a lot but that totally makes sense
the second movement is uh, humanity. Humanity, that's the movement that comes from the trio uh, of Elizabeth, Karina, and Joseph. I'm a graduate student at MIT. I study urban planning and transportation. And what really fascinates me is how we can bring innovation into urban mobility. There's very few studies on taxis. It's just not a sexy thing to study. So we did a pretty thorough diagnostic on the industry. What is the relationship like? What is the power dynamics like? What is the driver's working conditions? Um, what is the relationship between drivers and passengers? The study is called Humanizing Travel. Urban studies and planning is all about how do you make cities work for the people who live in them. I focus mostly on environmental policy, so that's both how do we make sure that we don't destroy the planet that sustains all of us, and also how do you deal with the very real sort of equity concerns that come when you're talking about environmental policy. investigating electoral accountability. We took survey data from around the country um, from the past 40 years, and we tried to see how well it correlated with the public, um, public policy around the country, and this is all in regards to energy and environmental policy. Joseph and Karina and Elizabeth, they were all in their own way dealing with different ways to help save the planet, you know, basically. The third movement is entitled Syntax that came out of the conversation that I had with Wendy. we do some language studies and I was interested in looking at like how kids perceive transitive verbs whether or not they understand that there's like a cause and an action in the sentence if you order the words in a certain way are kids going to perceive it differently Miguel took that idea of sentence structure and really ran with it with syntax. What I did was I actually took snippets of what she said and transcribed the rhythm of it, you know, and then like put notes to that rhythm. And that rhythm would become sort of like a section of a piece and I orchestrated that section for the whole band.
he sent me an email saying, can you check these quotes from the interview that I had with you? Um, they may be useful to what I'm writing in the piece. And then they ended up in the music, so I wasn't really expecting that. So it was pretty surreal hearing everyone say my words back to me. <laughs> I think my movement service really was true to what I spoke to Miguel about. I'm a quasi uh, religious guy and, and it made me think about that experience that sort of dogma of going to church and the music you hear at church and how that kind of brings you to a special place. So as I was writing her piece, uh, I was thinking of that, trying to recreate that feeling that I was getting from music that, that has to do more with gospel. I chose to work on projects related to food insecurity and homelessness in our community. I thought it was a good opportunity to raise attention to the needs that I'm trying to address with my public service. My hope would be that others would see, you know, that this piece was written about oh, some MIT student that was working on these causes.
I feel like this experience that we're having with this commission is a perfect example of call and response. We have fantastic artists comes to MIT and wants to have a conversation with students, a conversation call and response. And he sits down with us, he hears what we have to say, and then each movement is sort of his response. I just get so much out of playing in ensembles, playing on my own on the piano. It's a great way to like kind of relax. It's an emotional outlet. When you are um, happy, you can pick up your instrument and, and, and play a happy song. When you're sad, you can play a long, slow piece. It's not a conservatory vibe. We don't spend all of our time in the practice room. But I think that that helps because it makes that time that you do get to spend playing music so precious. It's incredible. It's like, how often do you come across a situation where such different fields are kind of blended together? It's so artistic. It's a great experience. I'm really grateful for it. The second last note yeah. on the tuba and the euphonium, that should be a B flat. B flat. I mean, okay. everybody that's playing that note. Bassoon should stay there. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. be natural. Yeah. Okay. I think it's amazing when we can find cross pollination and integration between the arts and science, science and technology, which is what most of us do at MIT. I probably will never play professionally, but I really, really want to continue playing for as long as I possibly can. I might have to scale down to a smaller instrument at some point. But I want to continue playing and I want to see sort of where it takes me because I've had really great opportunities through it so far. Mm -hmm.